look where I am right now. Because I wouldn't assemble the story that my past equals my future. The past only equals your future if you live there. If you're using a rear view mirror to guide yourself, you're gonna crash. So what you've been through is horrific. What you've been through is unjust. I'm on your side. But if you hang on to it, Was there ever a moment where you didn't uh, unconditionally love yourself? And, and if so, and if so, when did that shift where you stopped that and you started saying, okay, I appreciate myself because of my contribution and my service and who I am? What, when was that shift? I don't think it was ever I just didn't love myself. There are times, obviously, be angry with yourself or frustrated with yourself or thinking, you know, I'm not doing enough. I mean, I can remember my birthdays, to be honest with you, probably up to my 40th birthday, including my 40th birthday, you know, you have a birthday with a zero on it once you're over past 30, you know, 35, sometimes five years on it as well. People look at their life differently culturally. And, I'm, and I used to think it was bullshit. But sure enough, I would do it. And I remember turning 40 and I was really, really unhappy. I was like, Jesus, I've not done enough. I've not helped enough people. I helped tens of millions of people at that point already had done all over the earth in 100 plus countries at that point but it was still kind of stuck in my head. So I would earn the love by over delivering, change somebody's life. Like, I don't get it because somebody says, oh, I love you, Tony. I mean, I appreciate that. Or, oh, you're the greatest. It's gotta be my standard. My standard's higher than their standard for me, right? So when I get up and someone's gonna kill themselves and it's they're suicidal and boom, turn around, they're no longer not gonna kill themselves, but they're transformed, their life is there. You know, that's when I go, okay, you know, now we've hit the center of what I'm made for. Now, you know, I deserve to feel this euphoric feeling within myself and appreciation. And even then, I still know it's God coming through me. I don't have the delusion. It's just me. But I think sometime after 40, I finally saw the stupidity of it. And I accumulated enough that I looked at life with fresh eyes. And I can say by the time I turned 60 a year ago, I noticed it was interesting because my birthday, I didn't have an ounce of it. I was just like... You know, how could I at this stage of my life when I've had the privilege of serving so many humans in so many contexts, you know, from turning around, you know, guys are going to kill themselves with PTSD to helping kids turn around to getting kids off cocaine or adults to, you know, helping people build multi-billion dollar businesses from nothing. And when I've lived this long, I can't go by without hearing half a dozen stories a day or a dozen stories a day from people telling me how something I did changed their life. So it's not that I'm so smart now. It's just I've stacked it. By the way, though, stacking is the way you can do things. Most of us stack the negative. If you are really angry, it's not usually because it's just the moment. It's that it happened again. You know, it's like if you've ever lost it or overreacted to your kid or to a friend or a business or even within yourself, it's because it happened again. We hit this one, two, three, many point, and then our nervous system overreacts. But what I've learned is you can stack the good. And, but for example, if you're, if you go into a state of really strong anger for more than five minutes, your immune system is suppressed between an hour and a half to two hours. That's a physiological fact. But no one had done any study. I started stacking good. Like, okay, let me stack a dozen great memories, feel them, see them, experience them. And I felt this biochemical change that didn't just last a half hour, an hour or 10 minutes. It went on for a day or two. And so I think uh, I've learned to stack the good. So just having the experience is not enough. You got to stack the good to be able to appreciate it. But I, I think just come back to the main point here from my perspective, which could be completely full It's just my perspective. So I want to point that out. I think the more you find unconditional love for others, the easier it is to find in yourself. And I think the focus is serving and loving, and that's what will get you to the point where you start doing it. But if you want to speed it up, stack all the good you've done, you'll feel great about yourself. I already know all the comments that are coming through. Thousands of comments tell me, but what about my family that's toxic? What about my partner who's toxic? And how do I love someone unconditionally when they don't respect me? I can't trust them. What about situations like All that? those reactions are natural human reactions from ego. Because it's all about you, me, 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 what I'm not getting, what I'm not doing, and that's why you're in pain. And so don't, I'm not telling you like I haven't done this shit. I've done it too in the past, but it's an old <laughs> pattern I don't really do anymore. And I, it used to affect me. Now, not a dominant one, I wouldn't have become who i become. Early in my life, I developed this belief that life is calling not to give me something. Life is calling for me to deliver things, for me to bring something to life. And I felt the, the joy that came from not getting but giving. 
and I got hooked on that core pattern and then the pattern of learning so I'd have something to give, which I know one of the things that I respect about you, Lewis, is that you have that same pattern in you. You're, you're always trying to learn more because underneath it all, you also want to give it. You want it, you want it for Absolutely. you, but you want to share it, right? And so yeah. those patterns help me not be in what they're not giving me. And, and all this language, language, today people don't understand the power of their language, like toxic. What the hell are you talking about? You, you've been reading too much social media and thinking about yourself or somebody raised you to constantly judge everybody else. We live in a culture now where people, you know, you're evil or you're like me. <laughs> That's basically right, how it right. is, right? The whole world, everybody else is immoral unless they do what you do, think what you think, experience what you think. I mean, being a liberal, I was a liberal, right? Being a liberal growing up meant you, I would, I would fight for your ability to say and believe whatever you want different than me. Today now, everybody wants everybody to think the same thing. Otherwise, they're evil or otherwise they could hurt me. Whatever happened to sticks and stones will break your bones and words will never hurt me. We have this whole thing that words are evil. Words are action. Word, it's bullshit. And all it does is make you incredibly weak as a human being. And you're more than that. We all are more than that. But you know what? Like a kid that's never broken their bones, deathly afraid of breaking the bone. But if you're a kid and you're rough and tumble, you broke multiple bones and they heal, you don't have any fear of it. There's so many kids that have been raised to be safe and secure every moment. Anything that's insecure or unsafe, they don't want to be a part of, including language. And what it does is make you incredibly weak and fearful. And that's why there's so many people that are abundant that are angry all the time. Because they're angry because they're not growing. So don't get me wrong. I know some people are not a good influence. I'm not denying that. I'm just saying you're more than somebody's influence unless you obsess about it every moment and make them wrong so you can make yourself feel superior morally, psychologically, or spiritually. That's bullshit. Stop the pattern. We've all done it. Catch yourself. Because if you want joy, happiness, and freedom in an extraordinary life, it will not come from blame. Never. Mm. There's no pride that comes from blame. I don't mean fake pride where you make shit up to feel good. I'm talking about real pride. Pride is something you earn. Like people tell me, oh, I have no self-esteem because my parents used to say this or they'd say that. I'd say that's such bullshit. I'm not saying it's bullshit they didn't say that. I said it's bullshit. That's why you don't need self-esteem. Self-esteem does not come from what people say about you. Mm. Self-esteem comes from what you experience about yourself. See, someone can tell you your whole life you're a piece of crap and a part of you can go, you're full of it. I'm going to show you. Lots of people have done that. They never bought it. Or someone tell you you're beautiful your whole life. You go, I'm not really beautiful. So what people tell you doesn't matter at all. It's what you stack. It's what you assemble. It's what you create. It's the habit of what you put in your head. And today I don't blame you because we got a whole culture that's always blaming somebody else for something in their life. But blame is not a strategy for pride. That's why you listen to these blaming people. They're all angry all the time. Listen. If I wanted to blame, I grew up in an environment, I didn't even share it till my mom passed, and even then I didn't share it. I grew up in a pretty rough environment. My mom was a beautiful soul, but when she drank alcohol and she mixed it with prescription drugs, it was a different creature, and it was a violent creature. And I have a younger brother five years younger and a younger sister seven years younger. And my mom would get nuts, and I didn't want them to get hurt. So I was 5'1 in high school. She grabbed me by the hair and smashed me against the wall till I bled. Now, I never shared this, and I'm not uh, denigrating her in any way. I only shared it you know, like four or five years after she died um, because I was talking to a group of kids in New York City, um, all without fathers, 80% um, African-American, about 20% uh, Hispanic out of the group, roughly. No white kids, and I'm talking about your biography is not your destiny. And it doesn't matter what you've been through, what you decide now is what's gonna control your life. What you decide each day going forward is gonna decide your life. And I look at them seeing me, I can read their minds. This big, tall, white, rich guy is gonna tell me, biography doesn't matter. So I said, you know, let me tell you my story. And I told them the whole story, way more than I'm telling you. And every one of them was crying their eyes up when they were done. I said, look where I am right now. Because I wouldn't assemble the story that my past equals my future. The past only equals your future if you live there. If you're using a rear view mirror to guide yourself, you're gonna crash. So what you've been through is horrific. What you've been through is unjust. I'm on your side. But if you hang on to it, you have no future and you have no one to blame but yourself. And these kids, to their credit, man, they just responded to the challenge because they first cried their eyes out hearing all the stories. My mom would think I was lying and I wasn't lying. She poured liquid soap down my throat till I threw up and I wasn't lying. So. It's not the physical abuse, it's the fact that this is the person you love most that's trying to hurt you that messes with your head. Mm. So I could have been messed up for life. 
but I didn't. Because something inside me says, I'm responsible for this life. And part of that is because I started reading when I was 13, 14 biographies of people, the greatest people in history, and reading their lives and finding out, guess what? Their lives were far from perfect. Some of them had worse lives than I had. But when you have no reference and all you do is go online, you talk to other people, it's making everybody else toxic, and I'm like this, and they didn't do that, then you get to have this shitty life just like those other people. Why are they online so much? Because they don't have a life. Right? Don't be one of those. Free yourself from the chains of your past. I'm not saying your past doesn't matter, but listen, my mother, I tell people this all the time and it's the truth. If my mother had been the mother I wanted her to be, the mother she should have been, I would not be the man I'm proud to be today. Because I had to become a practical psychologist way before any schooling, figure out when she's going to go in the mood. How do I change her state? How do I protect her from the kids? What do we, I mean, it was felt life and death and it was to some extent. So I developed skills at such a young age. Then when I learned things, I just added to my skills, but I had a core sense of certainty that I could turn anybody around because it started with my mother and thank God for her. And she encouraged me in so many ways. She did so many great things and she loved me even though it didn't look like it at times. So, <laughs> right. but if your parents, if the people around you said all the things you thought they should have, if they had just not been toxic, if they'd encouraged you, you wouldn't have any muscle. And right now you don't have any muscle because you're using that as the excuse if you're thinking that. And I'm not attacking you brothers and sisters, I'm calling to you because I know you're more, otherwise I just keep my mouth shut. We're just, you've been hypnotized by a culture of weakness. Now having said that, I'll say one last thing, I know you haven't got other questions but so important what you asked. Yes, there are people that you don't want to hang out with that will not serve you, but then move on. Don't sit there and talk about it constantly. Don't waste your time. And you say, but what if it's family, Tony? <laughs> Mine was family too. And you learn to grow. You go, they're in my life. If someone can get your goat, if someone can piss you off, if someone can make you feel less than, that's God coming to you saying, grow. You need some spiritual growth. There's got to be some change in your perception, your belief, your emotions, your spiritual look of life. So that can't happen anymore. And when it happens, like at 61, I've been through so many of those things. And I like to do things in mass. I took on big challenges, so I'd have to grow more. But then life throws them at you too. When they come, you just go, okay, it's going to have me until I grow. What needs a shift in me so that it no longer has an impact? But, you know, Jim Rohn used to say, my original teacher, he used to say, Tony, what happens if I've got a cup of coffee here and he'd say, what if your worst enemy drops sugar in your coffee? What's going to happen? And I go, well, you'd have sweet coffee. And he goes, what if your best friend, your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your loved one drops one drop of strychnine? I said, you'd, you'd be dead. He goes, that's right. Life is both sugar and strychnine. So watch your coffee. His whole thing was stand guard at the door of your brain. But some people take that and go, oh my God, you can kill me. It was a metaphor. <laughs> These people are not so toxic. They're toxic because you give them energy. So if your mom's crazy and constantly criticizing you and it drives you nuts, just go, that's my mom. That's her way of showing love. And I find a new perspective. And no matter what she does, just stay in a beautiful state and love on her and think, boy, think of all that she cares and feels for, all that she's frustrated in life, or all that she's going through that's made her this way. And think, I don't have to go through this. I can love her. It's like your growth is the only limit to your happiness. If you're not happy, you're not growing in some area. And usually it's a place where you're blaming, you're pointing the finger. I don't care if it's government, don't get me wrong. People can be unfair, unjust, that's for sure happens. But you can't control that. You can't make it not happen. What you have to do is become stronger than any of it so you're free. Freedom comes from growth. Freedom does not come from control. Because control is an illusion. You can't control everybody. No matter how hard you try, you can't control what they think or feel. And not everybody's going to be fair and just. And you, my dear friends, and I, have not always been fair and just. Whether we admit it or not, it's just the nature of being a being, a human being. Mm -hmm. But we can make the largest pattern fair and just and loving and powerful and serving and growing until it becomes the dominant thing inside you. And then you experience life as being great, not your great. Life's great because you're living a great path. It seems like what I'm seeing and hearing from a lot of people that this past year, everything has fallen apart for them. Their health, their relationships, their finances, their mission or purpose, 
and these, you know, their spiritual awareness, like every area of life has been in breakdown mode for, for some people. Well, not everyone. Some people have had incredible lives and have stepped up to the occasion and broken through on all these things. But I'm seeing a pattern of a lot of people breaking down in many areas. Hypothetical scenario. Let's say you, you could only focus on one thing to get you started. You only had the time and energy to focus on one of these areas. Your health, your relationships are all breaking down. Your finances are in failing, failing everywhere. Where should people lean into first to kind of create that foundation so that everything else can start to rise as well? I think before you answer what to do, you got to answer why you're there. Mm. It is not because of the pandemic. I remember when 9-11 happened and people tell, oh my God, our, my life was destroyed because of 9-11. And there were people in the same building who turned their life around, became, grew spiritually, grew closer to their family, made their businesses larger. And the same building burned down, Right. Um, I know in my case, you know, 9-11 comes, if you can imagine, you know, I'm fortunate enough to have now more than 80 companies and all these different industries. And obviously, you know, I've done pretty darn well by most people's standards of business and life. But my core mission is what I do for a living. It's why I'm here talking to you right now. It's getting people to be free and alive and have the level of fulfillment to, that they deserve to have. I know they desire, but I also believe they deserve to have. But to deserve to have it, you got to do certain things, right? And so... You're not in the place of being overweight because you lost your job. So stop the bullshit. Blame. Blame is not a strategy for a meaningful life. Blame is not a strategy for greatness. So you got to resolve that, number one. And then you, yeah. your question was, what's the one thing to focus on if you only focus on one? I think it's smart to focus on one thing primarily. Focus on too many can be overwhelming. Other people, it's, it's good to focus on multiple things. It depends on your personality. So I wouldn't presuppose. But then the answer would be whichever thing you're most desirous of changing. Whatever thing is giving you the most pain. So if it's your relationship, I'd go full force on that. Now, in the world we're in today, you know, you don't usually have the, the privilege of going, okay, I want to work on just being happy. Well, I can train you to be happy while hell's breaking loose. You can sit in this chair and be totally euphoric. But if you do that in a Western culture, people come and take your furniture, right? So you probably have to work on both your business or financial side and some personal side. I would be working on both. And to me, the way to attack that, if you're not sure which area is to start with the body. And I know you can relate to this, Lewis, because you and I both share this in common. It's like, I always teach physiology first, as you well know. If you change the body, you'll change the emotions. If you change the emotions, you'll change your decisions, and you'll change the quality of your life. Because the quality of your life is your emotions. Mm -hmm. It's not what you get. You have a billion dollars and commit suicide. People have done it, right? You can have beautiful relationships and commit suicide. You can have people loving you and be sad all the time. Our pattern of emotion is our home, and you have to upgrade your home. You have to train it, and one way to train it is the emotion comes from the way you move, the way you breathe, the way you speak. So if I said to your listeners, uh, there's a depressed person behind the curtain over here, and I'll give $100,000 to their favorite charity if they had to describe their body, their posture, and they're depressed, you tell me. I'll just use, use the example. What does that person look like? They're, they're slunched down, they're looking down at their feet, they're not looking upward, their, their shoulders are over, they're... Are they, are they breathing full or shallow, do you think? They're shallow. Are they talking fast or slow? They're talking... If they're depressed, they're probably talking fast because they're not calm. Well, no, that's usually stressed. Depressed okay. is different than stressed. <laughs> they're slow. They're probably talking low volume, slower than... And all those physical characteristics change your biochemistry towards this feeling of being depressed. And in a depressed state, you won't do anything. When I used to be depressed, and I don't get it anymore, I just took it out of my life. I even took the language of it out of my life. Because the words you create, create a biochemical response. But when I did that decades ago, because I was like having those thoughts like, is there a reason to still be here? That kind of crazy shit in your head. I got out of it by using anger originally. I'd much like sometimes if somebody's really sad or depressed, I'll make them angry. And people are like, what's he doing? He's making them angry. Because angry is much more resourceful than depressed. From anger, I can get you to laughter. I can get you to taking action. I, so, and then gradually I got where I didn't need anger. It was about growth. It was about contribution. It was about meaning. So there's like stages to go through. But to answer your question, they should work on both their business side of their life and personal, one of each. And in order for either one of those to work, you need to be in a strong emotional state. And if you start with your body, like, you know, I start every morning in my cold water, start every morning with my workout. I start every morning on feeding my mind, right? So there's certain things you got to do physically so you're strong enough to remember the truth. Because remember, fear is physical. 
You feel it in your throat or your gut. So it's courage. Courage doesn't mean you're not afraid. It just means you're strong enough you push through in spite of the fear, right? And courage feels different in the body. So when you go lift or you go for a sprint or a strong run or you jump in that freezing water, when you push your mind to go beyond what's comfortable, you feel a strength inside you and that strength will help you to change your body, your emotions, your relationships, whatever. But then the other thing I gotta say is model someone who's successful. Don't just do this shit by trial and error. Like find somebody who has what you want Ideally, maybe more than one person, two or three, and figure out what are they doing different than you in their relationship? What do they believe different than you about relationship? If it's their body, what are they doing different? They're not lucky. They're doing things differently. You might be slightly biochemically different, but there's patterns there that you can see. And so instead of learning by trial and error, which can take decades you may never learn, Jim Rohn taught me success leaves clues, man. Find someone's got what you want, study what they do, every aspect of it, and then add yourself to it. And that's the pathway to speed of transformation. So now, like, you know, I've done it. I'm not the only person. There's so many companies that went from worse off than they'd ever been in their history to the best off because they found a way to pivot. But that required a psychological piece of not blame. So maybe it's time for you to think for yourself and model what works instead of just what you're told. That's something to consider for yourself. You've shown that you have the financial freedom, but you didn't always have financial freedom. In fact, when you were growing up, you were really poor, right? Extremely. Extremely poor. We had no money for at Thanksgiving for food. It's part of why last year I fed, I started feeding when I was 17. I started feeding families because I was fed when I was 11. And I fed two families, literally, and it was so moving. I said, I'm gonna double it. I went to four and then to eight. And then it was a, like a game to see, could I reach more people? And then I started with some of my employees and then eventually I got to a million people a year, then two million, then I started matching my foundation with two million. So for 12 years, I fed uh, four million people a year. And then when I was writing this book, yeah. I'm interviewing, if you can imagine, all these people start with nothing and are multi-billionaires. At the same time, Congress cut food stamps, it's called SNAP now, but it was food stamps originally, by $8 billion. Wow. So it's equivalent, to give you an idea, of every family that's being supported giving up all their meals one week out of every month for 12 months. Wow. So I decided I wanted to do something about it. So I got a $5 million advance for the book. I gave all the money to Feeding America. And then I said, if I want to feed 100 million people, what I got to do is I wrote a much bigger check. And now I'm so, uh, we did 102 million people last year, but wow. now I'm going to do 100 million again this year. And I got a plan to feed a billion people over the next 10 years. So I'm, um, I, it's, it's so full circle from where I began. Wow. It's crazy. And it's, uh, it's, it's an incredible privilege to be able to make a difference like that. How is why is it important to be thinking of giving and contribution in order to generate wealth? When people say that, well, I don't have much to give. Yeah. I'm barely making enough to pay my rent, my food. Yeah. How can I have the mindset of giving in order to build wealth? What would you say? It's, it's the only, you never get beyond scarcity. You gotta start beyond it. You gotta plant your feet. And um, you know, so many people say, well, when I'm rich, I'll give some money. Right. If you won't give a dime out of a dollar, you're not, I can promise you, you're not gonna give 10 million out of 100 million. Right not a trillion years. So if you, but if you start, what I always believe is it, it transforms you. When you, I had a group of kids that I went to, like when I was 31 years old, I was invited to this uh, grade school in Houston, Texas. And I, each grade did a little mini assembly for me of what they had to use my stuff, you know, at that year. And at the end, I was really emotional. And I was like, you guys asked me to come inspire you, you've inspired me. And so the sixth graders had only done it for one year. And I said, I'm gonna sponsor your college educations. I had no idea how I was gonna do it. I didn't have the money to do it, but I said, I was 31 years old. Wow. I was doing well, but not that well. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I'm gonna pay for your college educations, but I said, here are the rules of the game. And I just made it up while I was right there. I said, you gotta keep a B average. I'll get you mentors. There's no excuse not to be above average. You gotta not use drugs. You not get yourself in prison. And you gotta give me 20 hours of community service a year. Wow. And the reason I did that is I don't have a college education, but I knew if I got these kids who thought they needed something to be the ones to go give something, it would change their identity, it would change their life more than college. Right. And ironically, I think we had 70 kids originally. I lost 95 kids I was gonna lose. I lost the first year, it was like 30 kids. And the reason was their parents did not want them to have to do community service. They said no they way. should be receiving, they shouldn't have to work. And it was just staggering to me. Wow. But the ones that did it, I mean, some have PhDs now, went through that process. So I really believe that the secret to living is giving, as corny as it sounds. I had an experience where I was driving on the 57 freeway, not far from here in San Gabriel Valley. 
and it was midnight. I was driving my 1968 Volkswagen Bug, Baja Bug, and I was been in business for you know a year, year and a half, and I was working my guts out, and I was so frustrated because, you know, I always say that most people overestimate what they can do in a year, and they underestimate what they can do in a decade or two or three, right? So I'd been working for this year and a half as hard as I could work, and nothing was working at the level I wanted. And I was so frustrated. I was mad with myself. I was mad with the environment. I was feeling overwhelmed and stressed. It's midnight. I'm exhausted. And all of a sudden, this thought hit me, and I literally pulled over on the side of the road, and I've always kept physical journals. I still have the journal to this day. And I wrote on this one whole page, The Secret the Living is Giving. Wow. And I sat there and I cried, because I just realized my life for the last year had gotten focused on why isn't it working instead of how do I give more? And I made that shift, and it was one of the most important shifts in my entire life. And for probably a year, things started to get better. And then, you know, you're in business, you make mistakes, you know, to, you know, I was a young, young kid. And I found myself all of a sudden in a 400 square foot bachelor apartment. I'd lost the progress that I'd made. And I was so broke that I wrote about this at the end of my book, because uh, I was trying to, how do I get this thought across to somebody? And the most seminal moment for me was, I had, I don't know, 21, $22, whatever it was, to my name. I'm living in a 400 square foot bachelor apartment. I'm feeling sorry for myself. I'm watching Luke and Laura on General Hospital. <laughs> I mean, I was a mess. I was a total mess. And I realized I've not paid my rent and I'm out of money. And I don't have any prospects for some new cash in the short term. How am I even gonna eat? So I decided to go to this all you could eat salad bar that they had around the corner of this place called El Torito. Still there in Marina Del Rey. Yeah. And I lived in Venice, so it was about a three mile walk. I didn't take the car because I didn't, couldn't pay for parking, you know, for the gas. And I walked there and I went in and I had this meal where I basically loaded up for the winter. I, you know, I ate plates of food, just tacos and salads and everything else. And while I was sitting there, there was this little boy that came in. He opened the door and he was wearing this little vest, this little suit. And he, I don't know, probably nine years old, something like that, you know, eight, nine, ten. And, and he held the door open and, and in walks behind him this beautiful woman who was clearly his mother. And so, you know, I definitely took it in. And then he sat down, he pulled out the chair for her, and he was just so attentive to his mother. I mean, he was just so with her that honestly, I was moved. And so I finished my meal, and then I got up, and I paid the bill, and I was like $6 in those days, you know, for all you could eat salad bar, whatever it was. And so I had whatever's left, 17, 18, 19 dollars. And I walked over to this little boy before I left. And I said, hi, and I introduced myself. I said, I'm Tony, and he told me his name was Paul or whatever it was, I don't even remember his name, this little boy. I said, Paul, I said, you are a class act. I said, I saw I held the door open for your woman. I saw you pulled up the chair for her. I said, taking her out to lunch like that, that is really cool. And he goes, well, she's my mom. Right. <laughs> and I said, that's even more cool. And I said, taking her to lunch. He goes, well, I didn't take her to lunch. He goes, you know, what, I think he said he was eight or nine. He said, I'm nine years old, I don't have a job yet. You know? And I said, yes, you are taking her to lunch. And I reached in my pocket and I took all the money I had left, whatever it was, 17, 18, 19 dollars, and I dropped it in front of him. I had no plan to do this. It wasn't like manufactured. I wasn't trying to impress this woman. And he looked up at me like shocked and he goes, I can't take that. And I said, sure you can. He said, how come? I said, because I'm bigger than you are, right? <laughs> and he laughed like crazy and I didn't even say another word. I just walked out the door, didn't even look at his uh, mom. You didn't get her number, huh? <laughs> no, no, I didn't get her number. <laughs> and I gotta tell you, it was the most powerful experience of my life wow. because I didn't walk home, I kind of flew home. And I should have been like, what is the matter with you? You have no money for food, you get the last little pennies you have left. But I had no fear, I had no scarcity, and I got home and I realized what I'd done. It was like, I have no money now, I have right. like no money, nothing, yeah. right? I was trying to conserve by going there, you know? And I don't, I don't know that I just said, I've worked on a plan. I figured I'll make some, I'll figure this out. And the next day I got the old snail mail and came in around like noon and I pull out this letter and there was a, a young man that I had loaned $1,200 to and he had not paid me back and I was desperate for cash. So I probably yeah. called him 10 times trying to track him down, not a single response. And I was so hurt and pissed. And here's the letter from this guy saying, I'm really sorry. I know you've been trying to reach me. Wow. I've been avoiding you. And here's the money you owe, and I'm gonna give you some interest as well. So mm. I got, at that point, that was like more money than anything. And so once again, I'm sitting there, tears going down my face. I'm an emotional character. <laughs> and, and I just thought to myself, you know, why did this happen? Mm. And I chose to believe, I don't know if it's true, but I chose to believe that it's because 
I let go of trying to just take care of myself. I did what was right. I didn't plan it. I did it spontaneously. I saw it. It felt right to me. I did it. And I felt no scarcity. And I can tell you, I've had plenty of tough times. You know, I have 18 companies and 12 I manage actively. I got 1,200 employees on multiple continents. We do $5 billion a year in sales across different industries now. I mean, it's a different world for me now. But since that, and I've been near bankruptcy multiple times in companies and things like that. I didn't, I pulled it off always, never went bankrupt. But I faced really tough times. I never went back to that level of scarcity, not since that day. So it's a long way of saying, when you have nothing is when you need to give. You know, if you're gonna wait till you think you have something, you're never gonna have something of any size or scope. There's something inside the human psyche that when you do what's right and you get outside of yourself, there's something that'll click for you. And, and also, you know, tithing is a perfect example. I don't know anybody, regardless of religious belief, who's tithed 10% of their income for a decade and not prospered massively. And Sir John Templeton was the first billionaire investor, was the first person who said that to me. He said, Tony, I know you tithe, but he said, tithe more. He said, wow. do more, give more. And he said, you'll receive more, just how it works. And I found it to be absolutely true. Really? And you continue to give more and more every year? Yeah, well, that's like I was writing checks for five million bucks. I mean, work on a book right. for four years and right. give up all the profits. For, and then I wanted to feed more people, so I wrote another big check above that. Right, so, right. and now I'm doing it this year, I'm gonna do it for the next 10 years. Amazing. Um, if you can only have, if you had to strip them all away, you can always use one strategy yeah. or one thing to use, what would that be? I wouldn't. <laughs> okay. Part of why I'm effective is because I don't buy, buy that. Uh, right, I'm right. always looking for more strategy because one strategy will work with sure, one person, sure. not with another. Of course. Um, but philosophically, yeah. I would say that uh, the capacity to strengthen and increase your hunger mm. is the one common denominator amongst the most successful people. You know, um, you know, Richard Branson's a good friend of mine and Peter Goober, Steve Wynn, all these guys they've never lost their hunger. Most people are hungry to achieve a certain amount, make a certain amount of money, and then they get comfortable and relax, or to get a certain level of fitness, and then they relax. But, you know, Richard is as driven today as when he was 16 years really? old starting. I mean, he's like on fire, and he's 65 years old. Warren Buffett is 85 years old. He's as driven today huh. as when, you know, he began the journey, right? And so people that have that hunger, I believe intelligence I love people that are wickedly smart. Yeah. And I work to be wickedly smart by educating and training myself and so forth and training my brain. But intelligent, there's a lot of intelligent people who can't fight their way out of a paper bag, yeah. right? Absolutely. Hunger is the ultimate driver. Because if you're hungry, you can get the strategy, you can get the answer. If you can't model it, you can find it. So hunger, modeling would be maybe the next best skill, knowing that success leaves clues. Like, why reinvent the wheel? If right. someone took the, this plane uh, was uh, Mickey's plane who owns the Miami Heat and owns Carnival, right? I mean, you can learn so much from him. Like, Mickey, blow your mind what this man has been able to do in his life. And so why would I go learn by trial and error and maybe right. take 10 or 20 years when I could learn from somebody in a few weeks or a few months or a few hours something that could save me a decade? Too. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah. That's, why, that's why I read 700 books in the first seven years because wow. I was like, if somebody takes 10 years of their life, they pour into a book, right. and I can read that in an hour or two or three or four, why wouldn't I? So how does someone continue to stay hungry? How are we, you know, yeah. rediscover what they're hungry about? The best way is get around where it's better and things will hit you. Say it again? Get around where it's better and things will hit you. Who you spend time with is who you become. Uh -huh. So, you know, when I started coaching all these billionaires, you know, there's a part of me that said, I, you know, I, I'm as smart in certain areas as they are. I got to step my game up. It's not about the money. It's about how can I take the invisible and make it visible? How can I find a way to add more value to other people yeah. to such an extent where economics are not a question whatsoever? And then I can take those economics and do even more where I'm not there. I, I look at money as portable power. I can leverage my money to do things for people even when I sleep. Mm. Now, I love doing these for people and I work 18, 20 hour days right, still, right. but it's really yeah. nice to have the leverage of that as well. Sure, sure. Um, in a few sentences, what would you say is your current vision for life? What's, what's the vision you have and what's the legacy that you want to leave behind? I saw, uh, have you seen Hamilton, the play in New York? I hear it's incredible. I Everyone just, is I, raving about yeah, it. You've seen it, right, yeah. Nick? Yeah, it's amazing. Isn't it right? extraordinary? It's amazing. Yeah, yeah I, I loved it. I, I thought it was a lot, might be a lot of hype, but it was as good as, as the promise. Really? There's a line in Hamilton that I thought was really interesting. It says, legacy is planting seeds in a garden that you'll never see. Ah. 
I thought it was really interesting. Um, but so for me, so I know. The, what's the you, garden you want to create you'll never yeah, see? Yeah. <laughs> for me, it's human lives. For me, it's, it's, I love, my life is about being a blessing in the lives of the people I meet. I hope that whoever decides to watch your video, um, I hope something here will strike them and they can say, you know, I got to get in proximity or I got to raise my standard or I'm going to go master my damn money. I'm not going to dabble. I hope that it stimulates someone in a way where it becomes a blessing in their life. Yeah. And my legacy is the lives that I've touched and my legacy is the institutions that I'm building right now that when I'm gone will continue to touch people. My foundation, the work that I'm doing with mentoring with kids, mm -hmm. um, I mean the ability to touch another generation. But my heartfelt prayer every day is be a blessing. And you know, it's interesting. Sometimes you're a blessing just by giving somebody a few moments, just yeah. by loving on them, just being with them. Sometimes you're being a blessing because you coach them or you intervene with them. Um, you can be a blessing in so many ways, but that's my daily focus and it's not what I'm gonna build for the long term, it's really what am I gonna do right now. Why is that? I mean, why do you wanna create that legacy? Um, again, it's less about legacy than it is about doing what I'm made for right. while I'm here and maximizing it. I, you know, I want the end to have me, I wanna be climbing the mountain when I die, not sliding. Sure, sure, so sure. to me, it's about growth and it's about giving. Those are the only things that fulfill yeah. human beings. I always tell people, if you wanna be happy, it's one word, progress. If you yeah. can make progress, and if your progress is not only within yourself, but it's actually doing something of value for more than yourself, you're going to be a damn fulfilled person. Yeah. How do you stay grounded in your personal and intimate relationships when everyone wants a piece of you? You know, you sell out events, 10, 20, 30,000 people come yeah. to your conferences, pay tens of thousands of dollars. Um, everyone wants to interview you. Yeah. Uh, you're coaching presidents, billionaires, world-class athletes. They call you, they want you yeah. to help them break through the next level. How do you stay grounded in your marriage or with your kids or with, you know, friends? Yeah. My, mom, my mom's craziness gave me a great gift. Um, I wanted to be a professional athlete and uh, I wanted to be a professional baseball player. And when I got cut from the junior high school team, I figured <laughs> out I'm in trouble. <laughs> so I decided to become a sportscaster and a sports oh, writer. Wow. And so I took typing when I was in junior high school. I, I was the only boy in an all girl uh, shorthand class so I could capture everything because I wanted to be the best reporter, best sportscaster. I interviewed Howard Cosell and Woody Hayes and Dodgers and Rams. I got a job working for a daily newspaper when I was 13. Um, and then I got this huge break, which was, I got these interviews no one had, like Joe Namath when he was yeah. so famous. I got these interviews and uh, here in LA, KTTV Channel 11, it's now a Fox Channel, um, they were trying to get viewership, and so they kept trying different kinds of sports casters. They even tried Fanny Fox the stripper. <laughs> and, <laughs> and somebody watched some interviews I did and yeah. went, holy shit, this 14-year-old kid, I was wow. about to be 15, he's brilliant, and he's getting interviews nobody else is getting, wow. you know? So they called me up, and they offered me the job to be the nightly sports caster at, as I was turning 15. Wow. And I was out of my mind. Like, the dream I was going to have when I was, like, 25 or 30 right, was happening, right. you know, I'm going to be 15. <laughs> And my mom said to me, your ego's too big, and if I let you do this, you're gonna even get bigger. And she not only would not let me take the job, she made me quit my job working for the Progress Bulletin, which was a daily newspaper in Pomona, California, wow. doing sports. And I hated her, and I was devastated, but it created a sensitivity inside of me that that, that along with, I think, watching athletes who would not sign a card for a kid because they were making money selling cards, would make me so angry that I said, I'm never going to be one of those people. And so I'm not, you know, I, I certainly have plenty of pride in what I've been able to accomplish and people I've been to help, but I always know I'm just a guy. And while I've worked my ass off, I've also had grace in my life, you know, and, and it, I, I think when you achieve things, it comes from incredible obsessive focus, massive action and figuring out the, how to execute and do things effectively. And it's grace. Right, right. And I never forget that that's a part of the formula for where my life is today. Do you think people need a little bit of ego to have that kind of drive and insanity or obsession, or is it more just belief in a bigger vision? I think, um, you know, ego can produce drive, but that kind of ego will make you not be fulfilled. Yes. And, um, and we all have it until we get a few hammers, because in the beginning when you're young, yeah. especially a young man, I think even more so than a woman, um, you know, you're, you're trying to find yourself, you're yeah. trying to prove yourself to the world, and really you're trying to prove it to yourself. Right. Like in the very beginning for me, I used to attack psychiatrists and psychologists because I care about people so much and because I, I learned how to handle them in an hour and they're working with someone for seven years and I would just go crazy. But I was also attacking them because I was also defensive because I didn't have a degree. And so I figured I'm going to be on the offense. I'm going to show them. 
But as I grew up, I realized, holy shit, these people care just as much as I do. Yeah. And now I've trained 100,000 therapists around the world wow. with my partner, Chloe Madonna. So we make films of people's lives, like suicidal people, people who've been through hell, and you get to watch how I do it, as I do it, and then you get to see them two years later to know it really worked. Right, right. Um, do you ever question choices or decisions you make today? And does, does well, everything you touch turn into what you want it to be? No, of course not. No? No. Um, failure is part of life. I yeah. mean, uh, the difference for me, though, is I look at failure as a stepping stone to success. It's a, it's a speed bump. Uh, I know I'm going to fail, um, but it's not failure if you learn something. And so, yeah. gosh, I've, I've made so many mistakes. I've screwed so many things up. But every time I do, it just becomes, it becomes a way for me to explain to someone else what it takes. You know, it's like, here's what I've done. I, I think I have the ability to influence people because I talk about my failures. I talk about all the things that mess me up, but I show people that I didn't let it stop me and you don't need to stop you. And I think, I think that's really the secret right. matter. And if everything you touch was successful, you First probably not to relate to people as much. No, either. you'll be relate. And also, it's be total bullshit. Right, right. And everyone knows it's bullshit. And also, you'd be bored silly. Right. I mean, think about it. If you just said, I want this and it happened, I want this and it happened, you know, people don't value what they don't fight for. You know, it's like you see kids sometimes, in a, you know, your parents will say, you're not going to value this if you don't work for it. And you're a kid going, I'll value it, just give it to me. Right? <laughs> but it's true. Yeah. You know, the things yeah. we've worked the hardest for, we value the most. Yeah. So I think, you know, the purpose of a goal is not getting it anyway. The purpose of a goal, you know, is what, who you become. Who right. you become is going to make you happier. It's going to yeah. make you sad. Yeah. So um, I, I'm not looking for an effortless approach. Sure, there's, sure, sure. there's no such thing. Um, I'm curious about relationships and building wealth. Yeah. Is it important to, or, or how important is it to have the right partner in a marriage or uh, an intimate relationship in relating to building wealth? Does it matter who you choose, their mindset? Um, does any of that play the effect in how much you're gonna make or? It won't affect how much you make, but it'll affect how <laughs> your relationship a lot, right? Uh -huh. You know, getting on the same page is really, really important. But when my wife and I met, my wife, we both grew up very poor. But I decided that I was going to find a way to add so much value that money would never be a question for my family. And, yeah. and you know, it would never stop me from giving or doing or sharing anything. And I yeah. made that decision early on. So I became an earner, I have ways of earning. She became a negotiator, a cost manager. Her mom's number one thing is somebody comes in, she goes, sharpen your pencil. That's not a good enough deal. So, and yeah. so when we first met, I remember we were... Uh, we were in New York City, and this dates me how old I am, but I remember when they first came out with digital cameras, the very first digital cameras from Sony. <laughs> and it was like such a cool thing. You could take 12 pictures or whatever it was in those days. <laughs> but we were down in um, New York City. We're in Times Square. And we went into one of those camera shops, and it was Christmas time. And I saw the camera, and I was like so excited about this camera. And I said, you know what? I'm going to get one for my brother and my sister and my mom. And, you know, I came up with, I don't know, it was like 12 cameras. And they were very expensive then. Yeah. I, I think they were like $1,200 or $2,000 yeah, each. Yeah. They were really crazy. Now they're like 200 for the same. Yeah, you know, no, same. Not, not even. It's a million times better. Yeah. But I went to the counter and the guy goes, oh, my God, Tony Robbins, can I take a picture with you? I'll put it on the wall. And so I said, sure. And she goes, hey. She goes, sharpen your pencil. What kind of deal are you going to get my boyfriend oh here? My gosh. And I wanted to grab her by the throat and just go, what are you doing here? It's like, what are you doing? And she's like, no, no, what's the deal here? And he goes, oh, well, uh, I give it 10% off. She goes, sharpen your pencil, wow. 10%. You're not taking a picture of my boyfriend. And I'm wanting wow. to murder her, right? And I was so mad. I mean, I was so mad. And so she got like 15% off and free camera cases and all this stuff. <laughs> and I'm shaking my head. We left. I was like, I'm so, we have this big fight. Wow. Today... I just call her squeaky. <laughs> She's my squeaky girl. She wants to go to Walmart as if we'd ever need to go to Walmart, you know? Right, right. And what I do is I'm delighted by the difference. And I go, you know what? What a beautiful gift. I've been in relationships before where I gave everything and the people were totally unconscious with money. Yeah. So to answer your question, it's nice to be on the same page. But, you know, I, one day I, I told my wife I was coaching someone and a person gave me a quarter of a million dollar bonus. I don't care who you are. It's mind boggling. It was like, he didn't have to. It wasn't part of the deal. He pays me a million dollars a year plus a piece of the upside. And he just said, Tony, you did so much for me. I just want to give you this additional quarter million dollar bonus. And it wasn't the money. It was the generosity that just knocked me off my truck seat. And so I called my wife. And I said, honey, Paul just gave me a quarter million dollar bonus. I mean, I was like, he's so generous. And she goes, oh, that's nice, honey. Hey, do you know what I'm making for lunch? And I'm like, wow. <laughs> you know? wow. So I used to get upset about it. Now I'm like, that's my squeaky little girl. I'm thrilled she doesn't have to think about it. I'm in charge. Yeah, yeah. And um, so I don't think your partner has to. One of you has to master it. Right, right. 
and you have to have some alignment. Okay. Right? But you don't want them to be against you, essentially. Well, sometimes they're going to be. We were against each other in some ways. We're having fights. But what you eventually decide is, do I want to be right or do I want to be in love? There you, you go. Know? <laughs> and, uh, I'd rather That's be in love, good, personally, right? That's a good quote. And right then there. also, I just said you know, to her, I just said, listen, honey, I'm, I, I understand your intent. I had to go to her yeah, intent. Yes. Instead of being frustrated with her, saying, right. this is really actually a cool quality. And she's my opposite in that area. And it's a and we're a good we're a good balance to go. Right, right. If you let the outside world control you, you're toast. Because when anything goes wrong, it's in control. When you control from the inside, like we're in control of ourselves, we're in control of our world. So it doesn't matter what happens, you figure out how to get to where you're going. Um, the goals don't change. Sometimes the methods of getting there do. But uh, I have never, I think probably I had great teachers. I had a half a dozen phenomenal mentors. And I think I was raised the right way. You stay in control regardless, you know. Yeah. What would you say are some of the habits that you have that people wouldn't expect that you would have. Maybe they would expect certain things like waking up early or journaling or, you know, getting eight hours of sleep. But what are some habits that you do differently that maybe are unexpected in the personal growth space? I study every day, every day. Mm. Um, I've studied every day now for 60 years. I started to study this book in 1961 mm. and I read it every day. Same book, Think and Grow Rich. I have uh, just here behind me, I've got the laws of success, the original ones that Napoleon Hill wrote in 1928. And then he came up with this in 1937. And the man that gave it to me, he said, if you'll study this every day, he said, you're going to have a wonderful life. And he pointed out Napoleon Hill spent his whole life studying the lives of 500 of the world's most successful people. He was mentored by Andrew Carnegie, who at the time was the wealthiest man in the world. And he said, since he spent his whole life putting this together, he said it would be a prudent move on your part if you spent the rest of your life trying to understand and apply what he was teaching. <laughs> and, right. you know, that just seemed to make some sense to me. And that's what I started to do. And I've never stopped. If there was only one principle inside of Think and Grow Rich that you could only live by and only talk about, and you wouldn't be able to talk about anything else inside the book, what would that one principle be? Persistence. He said there, he, he said in the book, he said there may be no heroic connotation to the word, but the quality is to the character of the human, like what carbon is to steel. See, I think the trick, Lewis, is get some good habit patterns and live with them all of your life. Because... You're either going to grow or you're going to die. It's, uh, it's create or disintegrate. There's no such thing as leveling out and staying where we are. And some people think they can just hold it where they're at, but they can't do that. You're either going to go ahead or you're going to go backwards. It's create or disintegrate. And so if you have good habits, you're going to keep growing. Way back, I think around 1938, 39, Albert E. N. Gray worked for the Prudential, and he wrote uh, The Common Denominator of Success. It's a great article. And he said, the common denominator of success is informing the habit of doing things that failures don't like to do. Mm. And he was speaking one time, the young guy said, why do successful people like doing these things? And he said, they don't. <laughs> That's why they've turned them into habits. <laughs> you know? I thought that was beautiful. Because that's why they've turned them into habits. They don't like doing them. You see? And of course, a habit what, is... What do you think... Well, a habit is okay, something we sorry. do automatically without any conscious thought. We just... It's part of our paradigm. We're programmed. What do you think are the three most difficult habits to develop uh, that actual, actually will support us for the most growth long term if we can take these habits on? One of the things I think the most difficult is repetition of studying the same thing. Mm. I have a, uh, a book here on my desk. It's in a book holder. 
And when I went to visit Earl Nightingale way back in 1968, six, no, it was earlier than that, it was around 66, and I saw he had this book stand on his desk, and I asked him what it was. He said it was a book holder. And I said, why do you have it? He says, because I want to read those two pages every day for the next month, maybe two months. I said, really? The same thing. And he said, yeah. He said, then they'll become a part of me. Mm. And he said, that's really the, success, the secret of success is the repetition of an idea. You see that in sports, you play ball. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's definitely part of your game, you know. Uh, how many how many plays would you have in your head? Who? Um, well, a lot of different plays, but in football, there's really only like nine different routes a receiver can run. Yeah, as part of the tree of ru of running a route, but there's so many different variations within plays that that one receiver could run, and then another person could run in tandem with that. Yeah. So you have to. There's a massive playbook that you go through at the beginning of the season, and you've got to remember a lot of different things. But if you typically know the route you need to run and what other people are doing around you, then you can you can figure it out. But it's repetition that enables you to do that, isn't it? Over and over and over and well, over you again. See, same route over and over. That doesn't just apply to football. I think that applies to life. And if a person will really understand that, it's through repetition that you program your subjective mind. And it's your subjective mm -hmm. mind that controls your behavior. Doesn't make sense to some people, but if they would study it and start to understand it, they would start to do it. What's the most important thing on those two pages that you have open in front of you? Most important thing here. I'll read it to you. The lesson to be learned from the practical aviation of the present day is that of triumph of principle over precedent of working out of an idea to its logical conclusion in spite of the accumulated testimony of all past experiences to the contrary. With such a notable example before us, can we say that it is futile to inquire whether by the same method we may not unlock still more important secrets and gain some knowledge of the unseen causes which are the back of external and visible conditions? And then by bringing these unseen causes into a better order, make practical working reality of possibilities which at present seem but fantastic dreams. They're talking about the Wright brothers. He said there was a secret they got off the ground because nobody knew how to fly. And neither did they until after they got it in the air. But he pointed out that it was principle over precedent. And... We let precedent control us too often. What's We're, the difference between principle and precedent? Well, precedent, you're let, letting something that has happened in the past control you. The principle mm. uh, is that there's always a better way. Doesn't matter what you're doing. Better is a beautiful word. What's something in your life that took a long time where you were holding on to the precedent of something for a while? Maybe it was months, maybe it was years, decades, that eventually the principle finally started to fly and you had a breakthrough. Is there an area of your life you can think of? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Just as soon as you said it, yeah. You see, <laughs> when I started in this, when I first got this book, um, I was such a loser. And I mean, in every... Every way you look at it, I, um, I went to high school for two months. And I didn't quit. They kicked me out. They didn't want me there. Um, and I was kind of happy because I didn't like it there anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I held dumb jobs. I never had a half-decent job. The idea that I could even get a good job never entered my mind. I had such low self-esteem. I didn't understand that at the time. I didn't even know what self-esteem was. And letting go of the fact that I didn't have a formal education, that I never had any business experience, 
the man that gave me the book, he said, none of that matters, Bob. That's the past. He said, let it go. Well, I had a difficult time letting that go because we're programmed that if you don't go to school, you can't get a good job. That if you're going to earn a lot of money, you've got to be really smart. Well, you see, I didn't think I was very smart, and I didn't have any formal education. That's a hard thing to let go of. Mm -hmm. But through the repetition of studying this over and over and over, and as he pointed out to me, Edison had grade three. Mm. And he pointed at different people that had no formal education. And I finally made a break, got it, left it behind. I'm not quite sure exactly when, but I let it go. Yeah. What would you say are some deciding factors that can help someone with their self-esteem? Because you and I are very similar. Where my childhood, I didn't, I didn't have much confidence in myself or mm -hmm. esteem because I was in the bottom of my class in school because I was you know, had tutors and special needs classes because I just wasn't able to understand it and comprehend that well and felt awkward and goofy in my life. What are some, some things you think people that in their teens or even in their 40s and 50s who don't have confidence yet, what are the things we can be doing differently to gain confidence, to build self-esteem? Because I think this is one of the key factors of success is believing in yourself. It doesn't matter if the world believes in you, if you don't believe in you. Yeah. What can we start to do to change that? Well, I think a person has to start to study themselves. Most people know very little about themselves. They think they're their body. You're not a body. You have a body and you have a marvelous mind. And when I first started to study this, I thought, you know, Study in the mind, that's for psychiatrists, psychologists, behavioral scientists. And the man that told me, he said, no, it's not. He says, that's for anybody. That's for little kids. And so I think as we start to understand something about our mind and something about our higher faculties, see, we're, we're all programmed to live through our senses. We go by what we see, hear, smell, taste, touch. Well, I've got a little dog at home that you can see, hear, smell, taste, touch. All the animals in the world, they're, they're completely at home in their environment. They blend in. They operate by instinct, which is perfect. Um, we had instinct removed, and we had higher faculties put in our place, in their place. And if we would study these and gain an understanding, your self-image would automatically start to improve. You have perception, the will, reason, imagination, memory, and intuition. Those six faculties will give you the ability to create your own environment. See, we're totally disoriented in our environment where all the other little creatures are completely at home in theirs. And we're, we're disoriented in ours because we can create our own, but we don't know that. School doesn't teach us that. School is more interested in, in the development of your intellect than in the development of awareness. Mm. Like, um, a person doesn't earn $100,000 a year because they want 100 a year. They earn 100 a year because they're not aware of how to earn 100 a month. Awareness is really the key. And when we become aware of who we are and what we've got working for us, you know, marvelous things start to happen to us. And that's really what happened to me. I never went back to school. Um, I, um, I built a very successful company that operates all over the world. Um, I didn't do it myself. I have a tremendous team of people. I've got a, just an absolute genius of a business partner, a, a woman who's an attorney. I mentioned to you before, you should have her on sometime. You, she, you, you'd be fascinated with her. She's that interesting. But it was a group of people. We've attracted a phenomenal group of people in our company. Mm -hmm. And we're operating now in 91 countries. Wow. Teaching this information. You know, it's, I don't know another company that teaches what we teach. Like I think um, 
Tony Robbins has probably done more for our industry than any individual. The Secret has probably done more for it as much as Tony has, um, the movie. Um, but there's, I don't know anybody else teaching what we're teaching. And what we're really doing is teaching people how their mind functions and um, how to expand their understanding of how it operates. What are the six faculties again? You shared this before, which yeah. I which I love, and I think if people really understood this, perception, it help them build their self image. There's perception, yeah. the will, mm -hmm. imagination, memory, reason, and intuition. Which one is the hardest for people to? I don't think any of them are awareness. They're they're all equally valuable. Um, mm -hmm. You take your imagination. Think of this for a minute, Lewis. Nothing is created or destroyed. Look here. Here's a little cell phone. What you can do with this almost blows your mind when you think of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, when I was a kid, we didn't have a phone. We didn't have a phone because we didn't have any money for the first reason. But the second, um, not everybody could have a phone. We were not aware that there was an infinite number of frequencies. Today, there's, what, a zillion phones because there's an infinite nice. number of frequencies. This phone is on its own frequency. Yours, it's on its own frequency. If I have your number in here and I hit send, you and I connect, we're on the same frequency. It won't matter where you are. We can see each other. We can communicate because we get on the same frequency. Well, the good that we desire is already here. It's on a frequency. The way to build this has always been here. We weren't aware of it. But somebody took their imagination and went off into no place. What they were really doing is going on to a higher frequency. And if you'll stay on that frequency, you'll attract everything that you require. That's why um, Dr. Warner Von Braun, when President Kennedy asked him what it would take to build a rocket that would carry a man to the moon and then bring him back safely to Earth. Von Braun said the will to do it. The will is the mental faculty that gives you the ability to hold one idea on the screen of your mind to the exclusion of all outside distractions. See, if you take your imagination, do it. You have goals. Take your imagination and then take yourself there. See yourself already have completed the goal. Mm -hmm. And then hold that picture with your will. When you go there with your imagination, there is a place. Whatever it is you want, you went there with your imagination. There is a place. You stay there in your imagination. You will attract everything that's required for the manifestation of that picture. You saw Brady doing it last Sunday. Yeah, as a machine. Yeah. Absolutely phenomenal. So holding the imagination, the picture that you want in your mind, uh -huh. and then attracting it on the steps to get there. Yeah. You see, we don't work toward the goal. We work from the goal. You get the goal mm. in your mind. Our problem is we measure everything on the physical. And... Yeah. You look at the physical and you say, well, I haven't got it yet. If you think your conscious mind, if you get an image there of your goal, you've already got it intellectually. If you didn't have it, you couldn't share it with me. But if you have it, you can share it with me. You can share with me the idea that you've got in your mind. So you've already got it there, haven't you? Right. As you get emotionally involved with that idea, you've got it also on an emotional level. You've got it there. You've got it intellectually. You've got it emotionally. The only place you haven't got it is physically. Now, right. there's a period of time must elapse for that idea that you have intellectually and emotionally for that idea to move into physical form. We hmm. understand. How under much time? Pardon? How much time does it usually take? We don't know. We don't know. 
Mm. That's the only thing we don't know is the gestation period for an idea. We know what the gestation period is for wheat. We know what it is for a carrot. We know what it is for a baby. Moment of conception is about 280 days. We didn't always know these things, but we do now. We don't know what the gestation period is for a spiritual seed, and that's what an idea is. But it grows by exactly the same law. And so if we hold that idea in our mind, it must by law manifest in form. It moves into form. Now that is called the perpetual transmutation of energy. It's one of the laws of the universe. Wow. Uh, there was something that, I, uh, that you shared um, just a moment ago that reminded me of an interview I did with uh, uh, Joe Dispenza recently, where he said, we're, we're really good at remembering the past and actually building a story in our mind about something traumatic that was actually way worse in our mind than it actually probably was in person. We're really good at remembering these stories. But what we need to do, he said, is to remember the future. And when he said that, it kind of triggered something different. It's like what you just shared. It's like have an idea of the future of what we want to manifest and hold on to that idea and remember the memories of the future as opposed to holding on to the memories of the past so we can move into that as opposed to be stuck in the past. That's holding. So you see, what that's you what that there. is. Yeah. 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 That's, that's and it's holding hard. the memory. Why is it so hard? Why is it hard for us to hold on to or maybe not hold on to, but keep in our minds and imagine the idea of a greater future for us as, as opposed to constantly being stuck in the past. Why is that hard for so many of us? Because we're programmed to go the other way. You know, what language do you speak? Uh, I barely speak English. <laughs> How about Russian? <laughs> uh, Privyet, как de la. Uh, that's all I know. <laughs> well, the point is, you were raised with the English language. Yes. You don't know another language. I was raised no. with the English language. I don't know another language. I was working with people over in Kuala Lumpur a number of years ago, and they had a little boy four years old. That little boy could speak four languages. They thought wow. nothing of that. There's people who speak many more than four languages because that's the way they're raised. We're the product of our environment from the time we're born. But prior to that, genetically we're programmed. You're, you're genetically programmed from the moment of conception. You got all mom's DNA and all dad's DNA. And God knows how far it goes back on either side. Well, that is programming. That's in our subconscious mind. And <laughs> that's called a paradigm. That's what it is. It's a program in our subconscious mind. Now, here's the crazy part. You have programs in your phone or in your computer. The people that write the code for these programs are really smart mm -hmm. when it comes to writing code. They really know what the hell they're doing. The people that wrote the code for our biocomputer had no idea what the hell they were doing. <laughs> they don't. They did not. Mm -hmm. They were writing the code for my subconscious mind and for yours, that's our paradigm, and that probably controls our life to an enormous degree. It did with me until I was 26. Now, I was fortunate when I met Ray Stanford and he got me into the Think and Grow Rich book and that led me into God knows what else. I have been working at changing that program since I was 26. I'm 86 right now. So I've been at it for a long time and I work at it every day. Most people don't even know that they have the problem. <laughs> so they stay stuck their whole life. Listen, you interview some pretty interesting people. Um, I watched the interview here, a, a billionaire a while ago. Um, mm -hmm. um, Which one? I forgot. I forgot who it was. Anyway, <laughs> Ray Dalio, Charles Koch. It, uh, it was a pretty John interesting Detroit, interview yeah. anyway. But yeah. the point is, Anybody can become a billionaire if that's what you want to do. You say, well, wouldn't everybody? No, everybody wouldn't. I wouldn't want to put all my energy into that. Now, does that mean I don't want money? No, hell, I earn all kinds of money. And I probably want to earn more. But that's not my focus. 
we are programmed to live a certain way. And uh, rarely do we change that. Now, I change it, and I teach people to change it. But most people don't. Stop and think of how few people um, are really well off. Three, four, per five percent maximum, if that. And 95% are struggling. And these are some of these are really bright people. Mm-hmm. You've got people that have a, um, a doctorate degree in commerce and finance, and they're broke. How the hell could that happen? Well, they never learned how to earn money. They learned how to count it, invest it, and what to do with it. They never learned how to earn it. School doesn't teach us how to earn money. It's absurd when you stop and think about it. Right. They teach us all kinds of stuff that's, a lot of it's useless, but they don't teach us about how to earn money. And money is a medium of exchange that's negotiable all over the world. We know that there's some fundamental truths to achieving success. And every successful person will tell you, you know, and Jim Rohn is, I know you, you love Jim Rohn. He said, you either pay the price of discipline or you pay the price of regret. Discipline Mm -hmm. weighs ounces, regret weighs tons. (laughs) That's good. But the the thing is, can you teach discipline? The answer is yes. Mm. How? You have to have a willing participant. Mm. And if the participants reason why is big enough, if they know I want to achieve X Mm -hmm. and the reason why the motive for their action, motivation, the motive for their action is a reason beyond just themselves, Mm -hmm. chances are they will do more to achieve that success than if it was just left up to their own. But there are some people that are born, you know, with incredible drive. They just have this insatiable drive and they'll just, I'll, I'll do whatever it takes for the things that I want. And there's other people that want things, but they just don't have this insatiable drive. And this is where, you know, I, as much as I hated school, I love to use school as an analogy. Yeah. In the game of life, whether it's health, wealth, relationships, career, business, spirituality, fun experiences, you have to decide what level of the game do I want to play at? Mm-hmm. Is it the grade school level, the kindergarten level, the high school level, the university level, the pro level? Because each one of those levels requires a totally different mindset and totally different skill set. They're building blocks on each other, but if you are extremely talented, but you're not prepared to practice and rehearse and drill and fall and fail forward to the next attempt, you will never make it as a pro. You will never make it as a pro business person. You'll never make it as a pro husband or Mm -hmm. wife or athlete or musician. You just never will. So just get used to that if you're not prepared to pay the price. If you are prepared to pay the price and you have the aptitude and the talent, Mm -hmm. now we're talking about there's some real potential here. And what we don't know is, you know, what's in your heart? Like, what is the fire that stirs you that that you wake up saying, I will do this even when I don't feel like it. I will do whatever it takes to overcome my temptation for mediocrity, my temptation for excuses, my temptation for um, reasons and circumstances to hold me back. I won't allow those to be in my way. Mm. And if you have that within you, you'll achieve whatever you choose. Right. And so the question you asked before is how do you develop that? Start small. Yeah. Start small. So if you don't have discipline, show to your, show yourself that you can give yourself one command and one follow through. So you know what? Um, right now I'm going to get up. I'm going to do two push ups. Right now, not not like later, now. Can you give yourself a simple command, one sit up? Right now, I'm gonna go get a glass of water. You start with something ridiculous. I, I learned many years ago, reduce it to the ridiculous. Hmm. So for reduce it to the ridiculous, and I start, I said, can you do that? Great, will you? Because that's the difference right there, mm. is that's the razor's edge. The can people you, who yes, can, will you? will you? Yeah. Great, when? Now. Now. Yeah. Right. So if you develop that skill and Mm. specifically from a brain plasticity, a neuroplasticity perspective, as soon as you do that, you give yourself a command and you take the action, you have just created a neural pattern that you can give yourself a command and take action. Now, that may just be one time. Mm. Well, what if you did that every hour by putting a little bell on your computer and every hour, like if you were, if my computer was open, I'd have, um, every hour it, it would say it's 12 o'clock, it's one o'clock. And really? I take 60 seconds just to be in control of my mind. Mm. 60 seconds. I don't care where you stop I am. Stop what you're doing. Stop. Take six breaths. Breathe. Just get, just get centered. 
Am I on track? Am I off track? Am I doing something I shouldn't be doing versus a high impact activity that I need to be doing? Every hour I've trained myself to just reset. I didn't always do that. So I just started with one a day, right? then two, sure. then three. Then it was working so well. I said, great, let's do this every hour. But more importantly is as soon as you become the person who believes in themselves, you see, everything you do or don't do leaves an imprint on your self-worth and self-esteem scale. And you know it. <clears throat> Absolutely. You know it. Yeah. Every time you have that cake or that cookie, right. you either believe in yourself or you don't believe in yourself. Right. Yeah. Every time you're, you're voting with every decision, with actions, you're disqualifying yeah. with every negative belief, you're qualifying with every positive. Same with behaviors. So you start to get, uh, getting aware of, am I qualifying myself to move forward or am I disqualifying myself through what I say I want? And what I do or mm. don't do over and over and over again, because thought patterns become emotional patterns, which become behavioral patterns. Mm. And our brains pick up on our thought, emotional and behavioral patterns and says, hey, you know what? You've done that one enough. I'm just going to make that automatic for you. Right. So all of a sudden, you know, if you're a person has lots of positive thoughts, but you suck at taking action, <laughs> your brain says, let me make that a permanent pattern for you. So you don't have to think about it anymore, but I'm also going to create some neural tension and I'm going to make you pissed off at yourself. Now, now you're going to start talking to yourself mm. about how you don't want to not take action, but you're still taking action. Mm. And this is where we have this conscious, non-conscious ping pong match going on all the complex. time. Complex. Yeah. Complex. It's actually complex, but it's actually pretty easy to. Hmm. So if someone's listening right now and they're thinking, you know, there's a lot of things I want, you know, I want to get out of this relationship or I want the relationship. I want to have a better health. I want to have more money, whatever sure. it may be. And they've been saying that for years and they feel like they've been consuming all the information they need to have, but they haven't been able to take action. Maybe because their why isn't powerful enough. What would you say should be their first step? Well, the first step is to take one thing. I'm going to go back to one thing Yeah. and say, great, let me move one thing forward. Why? Because that just changes the trajectory of the same pattern repeating itself. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you interrupt a pattern and then you repeatedly interrupt the pattern, it's like taking a detour. And as soon as you take a detour one day, you're like, okay, that was, that was okay. Right. But you intended, your tendency is to want to go back to what's comfortable. But if you take the detour two days, six days, seven days, we know from a neuroscience perspective, it takes about 66 days to create a solid enough neural pattern that it'll go from conscious effort and thinking about it to a non-conscious pattern that has the beginnings of automaticity mm. happening without your involvement. You're just doing. Yeah. And so for me, what I do <laughs> and for myself is I, uh, whenever I want to change something, whether it's a habit, whether it's a thought or emotion or a behavior, I say, I'm going to work on this for 100 days, not 30 days, not 21 days, not mm -hmm. 66, which is right around there. I say 100 days. Yeah. And then I focus all of my energy just on that one thing for mm -hmm. 100 days. Why? Can you give an example of something you've done? Recently? Sugar. 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 No, I'm, sugar. A, I'm a sugar me too. I'll, I'm a sugar. <laughs> like if he was an alcoholic, I'm a sugar alcoholic. <laughs> Me too. Right? It's so bad. Yeah. So I, I go like, you know, a week, two weeks, no sugar. Yep. Then a month I eat dessert every night. <laughs> <Me too. laughs> 90 days. Me too. I'm you know, like, like a cake and cookie and, and five of them a day. And then, <laughs> and then. The same way. I can be very disciplined, but it's either way. Yeah. I'm extreme. I'm an extremist <laughs> as well. Right? So it's all or nothing. <laughs> high or off. Yeah, it's yeah. like no, no in between. Right? <laughs> you have one, you have a dead. Yeah. No, I don't. I, I don't have one cookie. If there's only one cookie, <laughs> I go, no, can I have like six or seven more? <laughs> my, cookie bills, my cookie bills at hotels are $21, not three. <laughs> so I keep replenishing. Keep, yeah. Oh man. So, so you take one thing, yeah. just one thing that you know, maybe a little challenging. A hundred days. A hundred days, just 100 days. Ooh. So let's say you want to drink more water. 100 days, a glass a day. Mm -hmm. conscious effort to one a day, whatever you did before, you'll still do, but one glass a day. So, you know, I started that with my assistant. So I, I want to drink, you know, like four of these a day, you know, right. like, you know, 32 ounces, whatever the case is. And so every, we got a mug and it's on my desk every time I walk mm -hmm. in and then I have some support from her saying, Hey, remember to drink your water. Just so I just do it. So the first, you know, two, three weeks, I feel like I'm going to drown myself <laughs> in so much water. 
Um, but then it's like, okay, now I'm used to it. Now yeah. I'm drinking as much water as possible because mm-hmm. the habit is there. And one of the rules that I love to follow is the habit is more important than the intensity at first. Hmm. So don't worry about the intensity. Right. Develop the habit. So can you take one minute a day to focus on how you will achieve a goal? Just one minute a day. Can you take one minute a day to focus on your health? Yeah. Can you take one day Mm. to retrain your brain? Yeah. Can I take one day, you know, or one action a day? Right. And you start off with something, you know, and reduce it down to just a minute or two minutes or one behavior. If you can get that behavior to be a habit, it's easy to stack Right, of course. It's just like the foundation of a building. Sure. Once you have the foundation, if you build it right, you stack. Yeah. And so every good discipline affects another, and every bad discipline mm. affects others. What do you think about when you have a bad day, or when you have a bad moment, or you react and you're not on your game, where you're calm in a frustrating moment, or someone on your team does something you don't want, or traffic, or whatever? What? How do you process that? Um, do you through- have bad days? Yeah. Yeah. I have, um, not, not days. I have bad moments, events. There's when, when, when we're, I want to separate like behaviors and emotions. Mm -hmm. So usually when people say they have, they're having a bad day, sure. Certain things may have gone wrong or something that they tried to do, you know, didn't work out. Mm -hmm. All information and experiences are processed at the non-conscious brain first. And then it gives rise to something we call a feeling. So emotions are processed non-consciously. The electrical and chemical reaction to that is called a feeling. So when I'm not feeling the way that I want to feel, Mm -hmm. I don't focus on the feeling. I focus on the cause, the neuroelectrical charge that's occurred in my brain. And in most cases, it's something that you're doing to interpret an event that's causing the neuroelectrical signal, causing the feeling. So in meditation, for example, wh- why do you meditate? Well, obviously it's great for a whole host of, of health reasons, yeah. whether it's, um, it's uh, less stress, less, uh, you know, lower blood pressure, uh, uh, less cortisol release, et cetera. But the one thing meditation does more than anything else is it gives you the ability to have a pause of awareness so that you sense what's happening at the non-conscious level right. and what's happening outside of you. So when somebody behaves a certain way, it's processed at the non-conscious level, gives rise to your conscious mind for you to respond. And so when something happens, I like to be able to check in so that I don't react mm-hmm. and I have the ability to respond. And if you do that enough through mindfulness, being aware, just being aware of exactly what's going on, then you have fewer and fewer of those times. So, you know, uh, uh, something happened last week. I was uh, in a hotel room and I spilled some water on a shirt that I needed um, Hmm. for a wedding that we were going to. And my wife was, oh, fuck, da, 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 da. She was going off deep and I was just calm. Yeah. And she goes, aren't you worried about this? Will it help? (laughs) <laughs> right. Like, no, let's just figure out what to do. The accident already happened. Mm-hmm. Why are we so wired to react in situations um, as opposed to be calm and say, well, this, this reaction is not going to serve a solution? Well, we have a misunderstanding of flow of information and the way information is processed. And so the reaction happens, again, at the reptilian non-conscious yeah. level. So... Every external stimuli, if you, if you get into some of the brain, which again is my, is my passion, is um, one of my friends, Dr. Evian Gordon, came up with a great model. He says, you know, the number one thing to understand about the brain is safety and comfort first, right? So in the environment that you're in, whether you like it or you don't is irrelevant. Your brain finds that comfortable because it's the homeostasis, mm-hmm. but safety mm-hmm. first. So any loud noise, any type of uh, real or imagined present or future pain Mm -hmm. based on the interpretation at the non-conscious level gives rise to automatic feelings. So the signal is sent from the reptilian or lizard brain to the emotional brain. And it's only later logically understood if we take the time 
to be to aware of it. Be aware of it. Mm. That's and why so, people react so much in traffic instantly. That's right. Instant reactions. Yeah, but but here's something you could do quickly. It's it's called a, a reframe. So so let's say you're driving in traffic, and let's say somebody cuts you off, and you've been sitting at the same spot for you know 20 minutes like I did this morning, <laughs> <laughs> and somebody you know you're you're maybe looking down at your cell phone because you have some time because you're parked <laughs> on the highway, <laughs> right? And um, somebody <laughs> cuts you off. So you could automatically react, go, son of a bitch, I can't believe he just did that and just use all of this energy, the mm. cortisol, epinephrine, adrenaline that's flowing through your body and causing stress in your body. Or you can say, well, what if that person just found out their dog died and they're really trying to get home quickly? Mm. You go, oh, okay, I guess it's okay if she or he cut in front of me. Right. Or they just got a call from their mother, their mother fell. Yeah. Would you change the way you felt about it? And the answer is, yeah, probably. Mm. And the reason, because you change the frame. So you can learn how to create frames for yourself of how you see the world, how you see failure, how you see effort, how you see your habits, how you s create frames in advance that actually serve you mm -hmm. through awareness and response versus reactivity. Yeah. And that is what a lot of people who, for example, I'm going to go back to professional athlete. What do you learn how to do? respond in a variety of different ways in advance or through practice yeah so that when it's game time <clears throat> you're just unconsciously doing what you yeah, can do especially like um you know i used to react a lot whenever i felt like anyone was attacking me physically or verbally on the on the game in the game i used to react and want to beat people up and hit people and yeah. respond if i got hit in a weird way i would always want to have the last say right the last hit and my coaches would always train me because I would always get flagged. The person who's the second person is the one who gets flagged, right. not the first person who does the foul. Yeah. And um, so I started to train myself and visualize, okay, this is going to happen in this game. Like someone's going to punch me in the nuts. Someone's going to bite yeah. me. Someone's going to do this. Yeah. And I can either be calm and focus on the next play or I can respond and have a penalty for our team. Right. And I started to train my, my mind seeing it in the future as it right. already happening. And that really supported me in not reacting. And that's actually one of the best ways. It's, it's, it's a cognitive behavior therapy process mm -hmm. where you practice in advance anything good or anything challenging. And what's really amazing, some of the latest research on goal achieving is the ability, you know, in the past I used to teach and also do uh, visualize my goals. Whether it's my body, health, relationships, money, charity, whatever. I used to visualize the outcome. And some of the latest research now shows, um, in addition to visualizing the outcome, visualize the obstacles. Mm. And in the past, when we talked about this law of attraction, no, don't visualize the obstacles, you attract them to it. No, 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 your brain's way smarter than that. Mm -hmm. So if you have, whether it's a belief that's in your way, um, a story that's holding you back, a circumstance, uh, references, you know, something that's holding you back from achieving X. So take a look at whatever it is that you already know is holding you back. I don't believe I'm worthy. I don't believe I'm smart enough. Don't believe I'm good enough. Don't believe I'm skilled enough. I'm too young, too, young, too old. Too old. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm too this or too that or not enough of this, not enough of that. So address that and say, okay, here's an obstacle. I'm going to visualize that obstacle being real. And I'm going to visualize just moving it aside and me moving towards my goal. The very act of acknowledging that releases the neural tension around. If you do that over and over and over again, what your brain starts to see is, yes, there was a struggle. And so it's worthy of me creating this neural pattern around this new <clears throat> effort. Right. Most of what we're doing is, you know, we're being on, we're on autopilot. We're just eking through the day, you know, on autopilot. And so the brain loves anything that makes it curious. The brain likes anything novel. The brain likes a challenge. Mm -hmm. So earlier you were asking me about, you know, one of the brain training companies other than ours. I said, does it work? I said, yeah, it's a workout for your brain. And if you can strengthen the neural patterns of you seeing yourself with an obstacle and overcoming it, what do you think that does to your self-confidence and certainty? Builds it up big time. Builds yeah. it up. So if you, if you actually do the work and develop those patterns in your brain as you're doing the stuff you need to do in the physical world you just strengthen those neural patterns and that's what becomes mm -hmm. your habits yeah and that's where it becomes really fun because you can develop the the habits and and the skills that you need that you'll actually take action on versus having knowledge and skills in mm -hmm. your head now i feel like you've been testing things for decades now with oh. all the research and the work you've done yeah so what does your morning routine look like now? Oh, great. What, what's, you know. So today was a little bit different, except for one thing, because I drove from San Diego to L.A. to be with you. But I wake up, 
I pee, I do my meditation. 20 to 30 minutes every morning. I don't mm-hmm. care where I am in the world. At and what least do you focus on during that time? I, I do a variety of different meditations. So there's meditations that I can do where I'm just observing my thoughts. Mm-hmm. Now, a lot of people think, well, I thought you're not supposed to have thoughts when you meditate. Mm-hmm. Says whom? There's hundreds of different ways to practice awareness. See, meditation is the art of awareness. Awareness internally awareness externally, but also the various millions of layers that exist in the physical and the non-physical world. Mm -hmm. So this morning I did a meditation with some ocean sounds. And so it was um, about five o'clock. I woke up this morning, sat in my little sofa, you know, Mm -hmm. my feet propped up and did a 20 so minute meditation in the dark with the ocean, just listening Mm -hmm. to the ocean, just paying attention and going into a trance like state where After two or three minutes, I I disappeared. Like my body was part of air and space. So today was, I was using sound to get into that trance-like state. Other days I'll do a a mantra, whether it's, uh, you know, a lot of people know transcendental meditation. So it's the Om Mantra. So you just take a deep breath in. Then as you exhale, it's Om. And the question is, why would you do that? And the answer is anytime you can give your brain a rhythm, it will entrain to that rhythm. That's Mm -hmm. one. Anytime you could pay attention to your breath, inhale and exhale, you turn off the parasympathetic nervous system. um, You you turn on the parasympathetic nervous system, which is your rest and relaxation Mm -hmm. and your calm state of flow versus your sympathetic nervous system, which is the stress response system of adrenaline, norepinephrine, cortisol, et cetera. So when you get the serotonin, oxytocin, and dopamine going, uh, and you're in that state of calmness, uh, you're able to enter deeper levels of consciousness and awareness. Mm -hmm. So you're able to observe a thought. You're able to hear your heartbeat. You're able to sense different things that are giving are being risen in your body through thoughts that you're having. So you can actually start to see when I have this thought, here's the sensation in my body and you start to get so attuned to what's happening, what stimuli is happening within you. That's producing these sensations that cause you to either take action or not retreat or move forward. You can start to get a feel for how the mechanics work. Before we continue this video, make sure to subscribe below and turn on the notification bell right now so you don't miss out on these great videos every single day. At the end of the day, it looks like, you know, you're talking about uh, using the power of affirmations, uh, confronting your fears. It doesn't seem like that these gimmicky thing, it's really addressing the core root of what Yes. Everyone needs to to achieve success in their life, but also to overcome any challenge. In in, in this case, directly addressing it to alcohol, although you could also write in the word overeating or anything Mm -hmm. there. But there are certain fears that go along with not drinking. I won't be fun. Uh, People at work, like if you work in New York in the stock market, everyone goes out and drinks at night. Yes. Uh, A good friend of mine who runs a company called Grocery Ships here in town walked away from $8 million in bonuses from Wall Street. And and everyone was going, come on, drink, drink, drink. And he knew he couldn't drink anymore. And everyone Mm. was like, give him a hard time. What are you, wuss, you wimp? Come on, be a man. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of the culture. It is. And so it's going to affect my career. I won't know what to do when I'm out with the guys, you know, whatever. But we teach people, you can still go there and you order a club soda Mm -hmm. with cranberry juice in it or whatever and people get off your case because they think you're drinking sure, something. Sure, sure. But the point being that there's a lot of cultural pressure to do these things and uh, most people don't have the tools. And what yes. we're saying is affirmations related to sobriety, affirmations yes. related to getting rid of the addiction as opposed to just affirmations in general. Right. And what people are saying, and you might know this too, Lewis, is that you know, most people know these general principles now. Mm-hmm. And now they're saying, well, but apply them to me as a manager. Apply them to me being a good husband. Yes. Applying to me being a world-class skier. Mm-hmm. I want it more niched now. Yes, of and course. so that's, this of book course. is an attempt to do that. Yeah, I love this. And, you know, for me, I've never been drunk in my life. I don't know if I've told you that, but I've never experienced what it feels like to be drunk on alcohol. Mm-hmm. And then when I was in college, I played college football. And the same thing happened where... Every uh, weekend after the games, all the guys went out and just got drunk mm-hmm. and trashed at parties. And they were always pressuring me. They knew that I wasn't going to drink because mm-hmm. I made a commitment for four years in college. I wasn't going to have a sip of alcohol because right. I wanted to have every advantage to be the best I could be in football. Yeah. 
but they still try to like give me every night. They would just throw drinks right. at me and I was like, no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. And it's, uh, I can only imagine the pressures that people have with drinking from their peers alone. Yeah. Even if they don't want to, right. they're just like, okay, well, I have one. And then it ends up being three or four because yeah. they want to make, they want to please their friends. So how do we set up our social circles so that when we do, we do want to go out and spend time with our friends, but when they're right. drinking or they're going out and having a few drinks, maybe we don't want to, but how do we have a conversation with our friends in a way that doesn't turn them off or make them feel like you're better than them or mm -hmm. you're too good to drink or something like that, but also so they can relate and understand and not continue to pressure you every time and say, just have one sip, just try this. Right. Well, what's the conversation we could have with our friends? Well, for me, when I was doing my 60 days and what mm -hmm. we recommended people in the book is to just say, you know what I'm doing right now, I'm just doing a little little 30 day experiment in my life to see how it works. And I'm, what I'm finding is, you know, I'm waking up earlier, I'm feeling better, whatever. I'm just going to keep doing that for a while. Um, and it's not about, I'm not one of the guys. You're still one of the guys. You were still one of the football players. Yeah, yeah, you of still course. did well, what you ever did, yeah. probably did better. And if you were to look back and say, take all those guys on a football team and see where they are right now and compare them to your success, I would bet most of them are not anywhere near <laughs> yeah, exactly. New York Times bestseller, yeah, top yeah. 100 podcasts, whatever. So Donald Trump, never drank. Mm. Tom Cruise never drank. Really? You know, uh, we have a statistic. I can't m remember all the names right now, but seven of the top 10 grossing film stars of all time never drank. Wow. Yeah. And a couple of them actually did, well, two did drink and quit. Right. And the rest, uh, Samuel Jackson was a terrible drunk and then he stopped. And once he stopped, that's when his career took off and amazing. he's made literally hundreds of millions of dollars. You know I mean? He's an amazing actor. Sure. Plus his little credit card commercials. Yeah. Stuff, you know? <laughs> so there's, there's a lot of uh, research on the people that don't drink tend mm -hmm. to do a little better. Mm -hmm. But I would say the, the, the conversation for me would be, you know, I get it. You think I should be drinking right now. I'm not going to. Thank you very much. I'm really happy the way I am. And, uh, you know, just stop it's right, not gonna right. happen exactly and just let people know and what happens is people are gonna press you like a teenager is gonna press yes. you over and over can I have the keys to the car please can I have the keys to the yes. car come on and eventually you get dad just doesn't lend the keys to the car right you know it becomes a policy like you know I don't think many people are offering you know Donald Trump a drink they know he doesn't drink and they right. respect him and they're just gonna not do it right so um, and we actually give some excuses you can give to people on the list sure, on the sure, website sure. too. They're a little more fun and sexy. But just generally, it's called "It's not against you, it's for me." That's a really good thing when you tell. It's somebody, not against you, it's for me. It's not against you, it's for me. You know, when people say, "Can you do this?" You say, "No, no," and they say, "Well, you don't like me, or whatever." Say, no, no, I'm not saying it's not against you. I'm making a decision for me right mm, now. I like I'm, that. I'm just experimenting with this. I'll let you know how it turns out. I like that. That's really powerful. Yeah. Huh? What do you think? Um, what do you think is one of the biggest challenges for people getting started with this process of actually saying, okay, I don't want to drink anymore. Maybe for years they've known it doesn't feel good, but yeah. they're afraid. Fear is the big issue. Okay. Yeah. Well, what's the what's the thing they're afraid of? They're not going to have that, that crutch. They're, they're afraid. Well, first of all, they're afraid they're never going to drink again. So would you and tell people? Fear people? Yeah. If you tell people you got to go to AA and AA says you never <laughs> drink again, that's wow. why a lot of people don't go. I mean, they don't go for other reasons, public shame they mm -hmm. don't go for some it's too religious for some people whatever but the big fear is i'll never drink again and if i never drink again i won't have fun again I, it's like life's going to become dull mm -hmm. and boring and i can tell you from my experiment from my kids lives and from dave my co-author you know dave coaches a, a basketball for his daughters he runs marathons he is a speaker mm -hmm. he dances he's a big football fan with the the with the denver team which just won the super yeah, bowl yeah. you know it takes his kids to the park every day i mean he's having a lot of fun mm -hmm. and he thought it would be boring because he had social anxiety as a teenager. And then when he went to college and he drank, all of a sudden he didn't have the social anxiety. He started having more fun. But it wasn't the fact that he wasn't drinking. In other words, nobody's not having fun because they have a deprivation of alcohol in their system. You know? Right. It's like, you know, you're not, you don't have depression because you have a lithium deficiency. You sure, know? sure, sure. You have depression because you're depressing, pushing down on feelings you don't want to feel. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that does come up for people, and it's a valid fear, is that feelings are going to emerge and perhaps past memories are going to emerge. But if you know what to do with them when they do, which most people don't because we're a psychologically ignorant culture, we didn't learn this stuff in school, then it, it's scary. Yes. What do I do with these feelings? I right. feel, they feel like they overwhelm me. I, I can't you know, whatever. My wife's uh, father committed suicide when she was eight. Mm. And uh, one night at 
I think four years into our marriage, she just woke up screaming, Daddy, don't do it. All of a sudden, all this pain. If I had loved my father more, he wouldn't have killed himself. Wow. You know, if I'd have been a better daughter. And so did she want to feel those feelings? Absolutely no. not. But because I knew what to do with them, because there's ways to learn to express them through, the, well, you have a thing called the total truth process, where you go through anger, hurt, fear, remorse, and regret, unfulfilled I want, and then what I do want, and then forgiveness. And if you know that model, you can get to forgiveness and love and release it. With tapping, you can release guilt, you can mm -hmm. release shame, you can release fear, and you can release pain, as Nick Ordner's new book yeah. uh, you re your reference talks about. So if you have the tools, you know you can heal. If you go into the jungle without a gun, you're going into <laughs> Africa without a gun, you're a little concerned. Yeah, yeah. You're going to get eaten too. by a lion or hit by <laughs> yeah. a hippo. But if you've got a guide and a gun, now you know you have the tools to survive yeah. in the jungle. Yes. Most people go into that jungle called sobriety without the tools they need. And most people can't afford the 30000 a month to go to rehab. Most people don't want to take that time off work, especially if you're a solo entrepreneur. You can't mm -hmm. afford it. Uh, mm -hmm. We had one guy. He's a number one of the top sales uh, trainers in America in the real estate world. And I won't mention his name because it's, it's, it's sure. confidential. But he read the book. Uh, when we did it in the beta test and uh, he had not been sober more than 12 days his entire adult life every night wow. drank until he passed out totally ashamed wow. didn't want anyone to know when we sent him the book he said he went and got a post office box so it wouldn't come to his homer's office sure he wrote he wanted two hours of coaching so we did that he wrote a check on a cashier's check so no one would ever know where it went wow and that's how ashamed he was. Wow. That's why he could never get help because he could never go to AA. He could never go to rehab. He, I don't even think his wife. He didn't want other people to know. He didn't want other people to know. And he's now been sober for four months mm. and he's lost weight. He's happier. He feels better when he's running his seminars. More people are coming and enrolling because he's more mm -hmm. wonderful up on stage. He's having more fun, greater sense of humor. Sure. I mean, it's changed his whole life. Amazing. And why do people love the AA approach or the rehab approach and why do they not love it? And, and is there a support group that people will get when they go through this book? Do you guys yeah. have something like that? I have nothing against AA. AA was very helpful to my two sons mm -hmm. for getting sober. AA, there are people there who care about you. They've been through it. They understand it. They give you mentorship. They give, things, yeah, right? they become a sponsor for yeah. you. Both of my sons have now become sponsors for other people. There is a camaraderie. Going through anything alone is really difficult. Any behavioral change. Mm -hmm. If you decide to go run every morning, it's tough. It's so much easier if you know Bob's waiting yes. downstairs at 630 outside yeah. your apartment. Yeah. Then you've got the accountability. This uh -huh. guy's going to, where are you, Lewis? And <laughs> it's easier. You're talking to him. If, right. you know, time goes faster, etc. So basically, AA has a lot of value, but a lot of people just won't go. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and, and the other thing we talk about with AA is you have to admit over and over. You have to say in the beginning, you have to get out of denial. I'm an alcoholic. But if you keep referring, if you keep affirming that for Even 30 10 years, years later, 30 years yeah, later. Yeah. Not great. And huh. the, the challenge with AA, and this was a, a friend of mine named Tommy Rosen who puts on Recovery 2.0, which is a teleseminar for uh -huh. recovery people. And he said when he got his 20 year chip, his sponsor hugged him and said, you're one in 10,000. And he said, only one in 10,000 people who join AA make it to 20 years sober. Wow. And he said, that's when I knew something was wrong. Something was missing. And when I would go to AA meetings with my kids, I would always want to jump up and say, God, let me run an exercise here for you. Wow. If we could all do this meditation. If I could teach you how to breathe and relax. If we could do this thing where you forgive your parents, you could quit having this story about how you've been abused your whole life. You know, yeah, you were, but you need to let it go because this anger is killing you, mm. you know? And so they feel that anger and then they don't know what to do with it. And they go out and drink again. They relapse and they relapse and they relapse. And then people feel ashamed to go back to AA because they've relapsed, yeah. you know, because they are supposed to be abstinent hundred percent. So that's a challenge. And we know that 20, I think it's 29 million people have, they, they say they're in recovery based on a survey that said, did you ever have a problem with drugs and alcohol? And is it gone now? Yes. Mm -hmm. We only have 1.3 million people that belong to AA. So we know people are getting sober without AA. The problem with rehab is that you've got a, well, First of all, AA, somewhere about a 20%, if you can believe the statistics, mm -hmm. recovery. Only 20% of people go, keep going. 20% of people like, go to AA, keep going. Yeah. Gotcha. And, and that, that number is suspect because uh -huh. we don't know how, sure. how clear it is. But let's, let's give it to them. Rehab, 15 to 30%, and that's also suspect because there's no real long-term, longitudinal Talking about recovery or 
or 15 to 20% recover. That's recover, what they say. A rehab. But we have 80%, 79.5% to be exact recovery rate after five years still sober, um, you know, from the first coaching program. Mm-hmm. And now after the book, it's, you know, when we did the beta test, four to five months still sober. So the reality is that with, with rehab, mm-hmm. you go there and I, rehab has some challenges. There are some good rehab centers, like there's good therapists and there's bad therapists. But a lot of rehab centers, especially the ones with places like Malibu and places, mm-hmm. they're basically real estate investment opportunities. Mm-hmm. I'm going to buy this big mansion. It's right. worth six million. In ten years, it'll be worth twelve million, and you're going to pay my mortgage every month because right. I'm you're charging me thirty. I'm charging you thirty thousand for the twelve or fifteen people there, and the staff, other than your therapist for a week, or once a week for a therapist, once a week for a counselor. You have a twelve step meeting every day, maybe a yoga class, maybe you get a massage. Now you got like thirteen hours left. What do you do the rest of the what time? What do you do? And you're sitting around. With other people who have these addictive challenges, <laughs> talking it's like it's like prison where Talk. the prisoners are like sure, sure. how to be better better prisoners, you know, better criminals. And so they're bored. And 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 you've got really lovingly dedicated people who are young, who've been through rehab, who now want to help, but they don't have the skill sets they need. <clears throat> right. So one of the things we're saying with this book, if you're a rehab counselor, get a copy of this book. Start mm-hmm. doing this stuff with the people in your rehab center. If you're an addiction counselor, Bridget Lank, who's an addiction counselor, she's a psychotherapist up in um, in San Rafael, is building a whole program around this book. She said, oh my God, this is what we need. This is what people need. They need a systematic mm-hmm. approach. And that's the thing. If you don't have a system, you know, you went and you played football. Your coach had a system yes. for exercise, for training, for fitness, nutrition, practice, plays, all that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. And if your system worked, you, you won games yeah. and you won championships. And better systems beat bad systems, exactly. right? And so this is a system. And as we said earlier, you could apply this to overeating. You could apply this to pretty much any addiction you wanted. I love it. And I'm curious to, to know about the difference between cutting back and cutting out cold turkey. Yes. Is there a better approach to say, you know what? I drink every night two glasses. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'll just start with cutting back to one glass a night. Mm-hmm. Or is it better to, you think it's more effective to cut out cold turkey? Which one's the way to go? Whether I'm talking about drinking, sure. smoking, whatever it may be. Two aspects to that. Number one, if you're drinking a lot, you quit cold turkey, you could have seizures. So you should see a doctor. If you're the kind of guy that's drinking like, you know, 12 beers a night. Getting or drunk every half night. A, half a, yeah. Half, yeah, every night. There is a possibility of, 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 of DTs, delirious tremens. So you want to check with your doctor, mm-hmm. do a blood test. We tell people that in the first chapter. Sure. If you're a casual drinker, a couple of drinks a night, we think you could just stop. And we encourage you to do that. Uh, when I do my Breakthrough to Success training, which is a seven-day training, I tell people, you're not going to drink for seven days. I want you sober here every morning. Yes. You're paying way too much money to yes. come in here with a hangover. And if you can't show up and do that, you got a drinking problem, you know? Mm. Um, so it, it's better to stop. We tell people in this program, we give you a week to stop. And, but we don't want you doing this program while you're drinking because you won't get the value out of it. At the end of 30 days, you can assess whether you want to start to try to casually throw another, you know, maybe mm-hmm. drink once. And we, we find 5 to 10% of the people that go through this program can quit. Uh, but those were, those were the people in the beta test who were serious alcoholics. Yeah. So we haven't tested it yet with people that are just drinking a couple drinks a night and want to cut back. With that, it might be 20 to 30% could cut back. Sure. According to the statistics, only one out of nine, um, no, nine out of 10 excessive drinkers can actually cut back. Only one can't. So it could be that cutting back is a possibility, but we want you to do the program sober. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, if you feel like you want to introduce drinking again, try it. But if you do it the first two times, you get drunk again, you're not a candidate for that. Stop. Right, exactly. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And what's the difference between thriving in sobriety and just staying sober? Let me just say one more thing about sure. it because we talked about different uh, addictions. Um, there was a Harvard uh, psychology professor, William James, famous psychologist, who said, when you're trying to change a behavior, uh, it's best if you can go cold turkey, like, you know, you're going to stop smoking, stop drinking, whatever, um, or you're starting a new habit, you know? Make a public declaration. So now everyone around you says, hey, wait, you said you were stopping drinking. Or you weren't going to eat sugar anymore. You said you were going to exercise, and you're not. You're just sitting here being a lounge lizard, you know, whatever. So, and then have an accountability partner. 
So mm-hmm. on our website, because you mentioned earlier about support, we have a, a forum. We have over a thousand people in that forum right now chatting wow. with each other every day, talking about day nine, what comes up for them and how they're dealing with it. And the support is there. Plus, we have a, a psychologist who goes in every week and responds to questions for people. Sure. Um, and um, Dave's wife's actually is a psychologist. Nice. Uh, and I go in and, and comment and give people support and encouragement and answer questions. And um, it's, it's really important not to try to do this alone. So we would say if there's someone else you can do it with, great. If you want to do it alone because of the shame factor and you want to hide it, that's great. But if you can find a buddy. And when we're doing a 30-day sobriety solution for, or a 30-day sobriety challenge for normal folks who are not excessive drinkers, partner up. We have one woman who is the, um, the graphic designer for the book and things. And she said, well, I was reading the book deciding what the graphic design should look like. And I decided I was going to start a book club on this. And so I got uh, 12 women. We're all not drinking. We're up to 25 now. Wow. We were going to do it for a month. Now we decided we're going to do it for a whole year wow. because I realized wine time was about five when the kids were driving me crazy. I'd have my two <laughs> glasses of wine. But then I was like kind of not really there for them and my husband for dinner. I didn't really want to cook. So now what I do, I go down in the basement. she got a little bit of, she, it's a fitness instructor and a yoga uh-huh. teacher. So I go down and I work out for an hour. Yeah. I'm spending more time with the kids. I feel better. I'm writing a book. You know, she's like doing all this stuff now. And so she's got 25 people all in a support group supporting mm. her mm. without some of the negative uh, overlay of AA where you feel like you have to go in and tell your drunk we call it your drunk log you know people mm-hmm. go and tell about their terrible how they got drunk and lost their job and stuff like that sure. so it's much more a positive kind of approach <clears throat> if someone's got an addiction and they know they have it they've mm-hmm. acknowledged it whether it's drinking smoking sex something workaholic mm-hmm. whatever it may be even fitness addiction you know there's people that work out all day yeah you we know, have people addicted to plastic surgery of course yeah there's yeah. all sorts of addiction yeah when we realize, okay, there's an addiction that I have that, I'm, that I want to end and I want to move on to something more positive in my life, mm-hmm. and I'm sure you probably have this in here, but is there a, uh, a process you think that everyone should follow in the morning to get them ready for the day and at night to get them ready for a day, specifically focusing in on that addiction? Is there a... Yeah. You uh, want to you you get up in the morning and you want to visualize going through the day with not doing the addiction, Okay. Uh, there's something in the, we call it evening review at the end of the day where you close your eyes and you say, where could have I been more on purpose or more on focus for this commitment I have? Oh, you know, you did that thing, you did that thing, you did that thing. Um, and so it's just checking in, checking in, checking in. Uh, you want to program your day, schedule your day. What are your activities going to be? The problem is, see, if something mm-hmm. shows up at five o'clock and I'm bored and I don't have anything to do, I'm Back in trouble. Or whatever, yeah. And there's this thing called decision fatigue. And there's also something called compassion fatigue. It started, they first learned this where they were doing federal, uh, in prisons where they're doing parole boards. In the morning, 70% of the people who were up for parole got paroled. In the afternoon, it was like anywhere between 10 and 30%, mm. depending on the prison. People got tired of making decisions. They just, oh, screw it, I'm not getting out. Wow. And so what happens is as the day goes on, your willpower wanes. Willpower is like a meter. And so... In the morning, if you're going to do an exercise, if you're adding exercise into your day, do it first thing in the morning. Yeah. You know, we put your shoes and your running shoes. You have to trip over them before you go into the bathroom. Exactly. And if you have a partner. Wear your shorts, uh, your workout shorts to bed. To bed. There yeah. you go. There you go. And so, and then having that accountability partner, uh-huh. someone else you're doing it with that you're, you're, you know, you can have, a, like, you could be my accountability partner for this. I call you every day say, okay, here's what I'm going to do today. This is my rule. And at five o'clock, I'm going to do this exercise mm-hmm. or I'm going to go do a solution in a book or I'm going to play my guitar for an hour, whatever it is. And we give people 101 alternative activities that bring joy into your life other than drinking in one of the chapters so you can pick one every day and do it or you pick one and stay with the same thing every day and then I mean, one of my favorite ones is listening to comedy albums. I mean, there's so many great yeah, comedians now. So go, to, amazing. go to iTunes and download a comedy album. Yeah, yeah. Just laugh. And laughter <laughs> secretes endorphins in the brain. Endorphins are natural opiate. You don't need to drink if you're mm. laughing. Mm. You know? Um, and so laughter is, is really important. Uh, so laughing is great. And you can do laughter yoga. Have you heard of laughter yoga? No. Laughter yoga is really cool. It was developed by a doctor in India. And he gets people like, and I teach it in my seminars now in the morning. It's like a little warm-up exercise. Mm-hmm. And you just start laughing <laughs> see how you start Why? to laugh right along with me and then you do these stupid things like milkshake laughter you go like you, you pretend you're making a milkshake you go mm, mm, 
And then instead of drinking it, you just throw it on the other person. You go, <laughs> <laughs> and they're throwing theirs on you. Uh-huh. Stupid stuff. Right, right. But now you got 50, 60 people all laughing together. But I can wake up in the morning and just laugh, or I can listen to a comedy thing in the uh-huh. morning and laugh. Uh, the other thing is you want to do a gratitude exercise. One of the things we found, and we were kind of surprised by it. We knew it was important, law of attraction, all mm-hmm. that. But one of the top things when we asked people what was the most important in the book, gratitude. People basically, a lot of them drink because they think their life sucks. But when you really start realizing that half the world lives on $2 a day, your life doesn't suck that bad. Yeah. You know? And we have, look at all the technology that you have in this office here and the people that are supporting you and the fact that someone made this table mm-hmm. and someone printed that book and Steve Jobs gave you the computer <laughs> exactly. you got there and it works really well and yeah. you can communicate with people in Singapore. And you could just literally go around the room for five minutes and just appreciate everything. It gets you blissed out. Yeah. So that's a really good thing to do in the morning as well. I love that. And, um, oh, and meditation and breathing. Mm-hmm. Do you have a good breathing? When someone's feeling the overwhelm and they're like, yeah. I really want to drink this right now or I really want to eat this or whatever it is. There's a tech, the, well, do the cravings, do the tapping. But uh, Andrew Weil, do you know Andrew Weil? No. Andrew Weil is one of the greatest uh, integrative medicine doctors because he's a big white beard uh-huh. and uh, I've met him a couple of times. Anyway, he teaches this thing. It's called uh, four, seven, eight breathing. And what you do is you start by exhaling and go, Get all the air out. Then through your nose, you inhale to the count of four. And then you hold for the count of seven. And then very slowly through the mouth, exhale for the count of eight. You do four of those. Mm. I just did one. I already feel, feel more little, relaxed <laughs> yeah, more, and a little more energized, yeah, that kind yeah, of like yeah. funny feeling in the head. Sure. So you do four of those uh-huh. and it calms you out. So again, why do people drink? Well, I'm going to have a difficult meeting, you know, or I had a little stress at work today, or I'm going to go home and my wife's going to be on my case because I forgot to clean the garage, whatever. Just do that breathing sitting in the car before you get out or before you walk in the meeting or before the person comes in the door. This is what is happening to people's lives. They are trying to fix everything with their mm-hmm. intellect. The harder they try, the more tatters they have become. Mm-hmm. With all this education, tell me, uneducated people are more unhappy or educated people are more unhappy?